Thank you. Yeah. Didn't realize till we sang that hymn how much I've missed singing. I just those lines that caught me today were, or thorns compose so rich a crown. Crown of thorns. Amen. May God bless uh, his word to us as we turn to it now and, and reflect on what we've had read to us and pray that this will be a blessing to each one of us. Amanda read uh, that when Paul was in Ephesus, there was serious trouble in Ephesus because of the way of the Lord. And so I want to pick up on that idea, serious trouble in Ephesus. I once heard an Anglican bishop say that when he went visiting his flock, there was always a cup of tea on the go. But when Paul went visiting, there was always a riot. And I just uh, couldn't help thinking about this. Uh, Christine and I, as I mentioned last week, uh, were privileged to visit uh, with friends uh, the city of Ephesus in southwestern Turkey. And uh, I photographed lots of things that I didn't know what they were. But uh, one of the inscriptions that I photographed is, is this one here. The Nymphanium Trajani, or whatever it is, I can't exactly, it's presumably in Turkish. Uh, but it says, the, founda- the fountain building was donated by Tiberius Claudius Aristion and his wife between AD 102 and 114. So it's a fountain, the ruins of a fountain that we were looking at. This was the plaque in front of them. And it says, uh, in honor of Artemis of Ephesus, So around the year 100, Artemis was still being revered. Last week I produced this coin, this photo of a coin. This is a coin featuring Artemis. It says on it, Diana Ephesia. Diana is the Latin name for this goddess. Uh, And you might remember if you grew up on the authorized version, the greatest Artemis of Ephesus was greatest Diana of the Ephesians. So this is her. And... Here is her name in the inscription. And it also mentions the Emperor Trajan, who was the emperor between 98 and 117. And that struck me as well, because the letters of the younger Pliny were written in the year 110. And he was a, he was a governor of, in Turkey. And he wrote to Trajan, the emperor in Rome, for advice about all sorts of things. And in his 10th book of letters, around letter 98... He's saying, it's quite a long letter, and he's caught a couple of Christian women. And he's tortured them and found out what they do. They meet on the first day of the week before dawn. They sing hymns to someone called Christ as if he was God. They go on oath not to tell lies, not to steal, and to live upright lives. And they they don't worship They're part of the reason that the shrines are not being worshipped anymore. People are not going the way they used to in the old days. So he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give them three chances to say they're not going to be a Christian anymore. And if they persist in saying they're still going to follow Christus, then I'll have them killed. What do you think about this Trajan? And Trajan says, because the replies are there in the book, the reply is, that's that very, very wise, Pliny. Uh, it, if they persist after three opportunities, then they should be killed. And so that's, that's the tone under which the Christians were living in Trajan's reign in the year 110. But as for the fountain that was donated, this wasn't there because Paul was in town 50 years before this fountain was opened. It's actually 60 years before this fountain was dedicated. And... Uh, And here is Artemis. I've got a little image of Artemis at home. Uh, Mine is plastic. They don't make them in silver anymore. At least I don't think they do. Uh, But we had a very dear friend when we lived in New South Wales. Her name was Mary Dolan. And Mary uh, would come to the Bible study in our home on Sunday nights. She was a teacher of ancient history and a really keen archaeologist. So whenever she had a long vacation, she went off to the Middle East for a dig. And so I've got one or two items from her digs. And this is one she sent me. It's, uh, of course, it's just a plastic replica of Diana. And you can see its scale sitting 
on my computer. I've actually got it in my bag in the back room. But here she is. Uh, she is the goddess that was worshipped in Ephesus. It was for hundreds of years, the story of this woman. And we have it in the text in, in Acts 19. They, a meteorite fell from the sky and they believed they were being visited by God. But when we went there, it was just me and Christine and our friends. Here's Christine with Donald Cameron. Uh, it's a good photo because they're both uh, looking smiling and in red. And, uh, and the background is the amphitheater where the action takes place that Amanda read about. It's built into the hillside. It, it uh, seats 25,000 people. I, I don't think you can speak to hardly 1,000 people in the tennis center without a PA system. But these places are designed so that they're built around uh, a place where the speaker stands, and if you raise your voice, you can be heard right around the whole, the whole gallery. So this was where the riot took place, and, and we were there. And I, I'm just taking, taking uh, my wife and, and Donald out of the amphitheater for a minute and just using that as an image for uh, our meditation this morning as we look, think of several things that the chapter brought to my mind. And the first thing is idols, ancient and modern. And the second thing I want to think about is which Australian dream for us? And then I want to tell you a parable of the pesos and the bank. And then I want to pick up a line from an Australian poem, The True God Gives. Okay, so just a few ideas based uh, on the passage we've looked at. And first of all, I want to think about idols, ancient and modern. Well, uh, Paul had been, uh, as, as we've seen, uh, to Philippi. Uh, where there was uproar in Thessalonica, there was, uh, uh, well, there was imprisonment in Philippi, uh, an uproar in Thessalonica, opposition in Corinth, and now a riot in Ephesus. What was going on? Well, we've already been told. In chapter 17, we heard that, that in Jason's house, there were these people who were, as the authorized version puts it, turning the world upside down. They were inverting people's ideas. They were saying that someone called Jesus had risen from the dead and was the Messiah. Now, after the, uh, I'll just give you the, uh, the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that cruel and fickle, passionate and vindictive, jealous and insecure, petty and insane, the inhabitants of Mount Olympus represent an attempt by the ancient Greeks to explain the chaos of the universe through human nature. This is a very interesting thing that the Greeks in their philosophy saw the chaos of the universe. And the Babylonian creation story is about the chaos. And so is the Assyrian creation story. But alone in the Middle East is the Jewish creation story that says it's not drawn out of chaos. It's drawn out of a loving purpose of a single deity. And that purpose has so persisted in the West that we have the idea of a universe that, that everything can make sense, can be held together because there is one God. So let's think for a moment about the Greek and the Roman gods. Um, I don't even know how to say this one's name. Hephaestus, perhaps? The, goddess of, the god of craftsmanship. Now, how, how much do we value craftsmanship? Well, Here's something that I looked up. Uh, I was looking, at, of course, at Greek and Roman gods. And this is a plate that you can buy. Uh, I, I looked up Medusa. Medusa is a god of, well, a god that wards off evil and harm. And, of course, it's, it's used by uh, one, of the, uh, one of the quality companies, uh, I'm, I'm not terribly sure how to say that either, but Versace, is that right? Versace? Right. The image, that, the icon that Versace uses is the head of Medusa, the god that protects you from, from harm. And uh, we're told here that you, this is a quality item. Uh, it says here, and you can't read it, so I've put it up above, Versace and Rosenthal are synonymous for excellence and craftsmanship. And you can buy this plate, it's 18 centimetre plate, porcelain, for uh, 
231 uh, euros and 9 euro cents. So it's about $500 for this plate. So how many people are you having around for dinner? Six maybe, so you need eight plates. At $1,000 for every couple, just for the plate. Well, maybe you want to put it on the wall because you can only afford one. Or maybe, maybe you just want to appreciate it as a work of art. How skillful that is. So that's craftsmanship. But then there's Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. And then there's uh, Artemis, fertility and wealth in Ephesus, very wealthy city. Ares, the god of war, the Latin name, of course, being Mars. Got nothing to do with Mars bars, apparently. So, uh, but there you go. So here are just some of the gods. And you only have to think for a moment how beauty is uh, prioritized in our community. Or, or fertility and wealth and war. I'm always reminded by a Leonard Cohen line that says, I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. What amazing weapons we can make. Hypersonic missiles. It's just an amazing concept. Why, why do we do this? And why do we spend so much, so, such vast amounts on the destructive potential and such small amounts on health, education, cleaning up the environment? So every culture, says Tim Keller, is dominated by its own set of idols. And not only that, uh, each one has its shrines, whether it's an office tower, a spa, a gym, a studio, a stadium. So it is. And we can, we can think about the, the uh, names of the companies that are, are connected with ancient gods. In Ephesus, in fact, one of the first things we were pointed out by our guide was the Nike swoosh, because Nike was the god of, vi of victory. And here is the Nike swoosh in a rock at Ephesus. And of course, Nike has taken it over and put it on its running shoes and everything that it manufactures. So Nike and uh, uh, Amazon, you've heard of Amazon? They're taking over the world. The richest man in the world owns Amazon, named after a, a Greek and Roman god, and so on. So you, you don't need me to perhaps go through that, but, but it's all there. And so uh, when we, we think about the world in which we're living in, what is our dream of Australia? What do we aspire to in Australia? I think the Australian dream used to be a home of your own on a quarter acre block. Remember that idea? So let's think about it. I forgot the hill's hoist. It's so much nicer to have a hill's hoist than to have to walk up and down a long clothesline. I remember my dad building duckboards to go under a long clothesline because we didn't have a hill's hoist. We just had mud when we moved in. And uh, so my mother needed better walk out of the mud. And so dad built these duck boards. And my mother could hang out the washing along the clothesline without getting her feet muddy. But then we, we probably added a barbecue at some point. We, it's a kind of an Australian thing, isn't it? And, uh, but who? A pool? Some parts of Australia you fly over when you're coming into land and you see all the pools in the backyards. Um, so, so is our, our desire for something, are we climbing here? Is there an escalation? About 50% of Australians owned their own home in the middle of last century. But in the 20 years after the war, it climbed up to 70%. But it seems to have tapered a bit since then. And it's getting harder to own your own home. Some people would add two cars before they even have a home nowadays. And, uh, and a bigger TV, in fact, maybe a, a smarter TV, and maybe even a television room, a cinema room. Uh, we can keep adding things here. A beach house. Well, we could go on. Our standard of living seems, we seem to want, each generation seems to want to begin with the last generation finished. And so we're climbing our, and we, uh, we there's, there's nothing wrong about having a, a dream and uh, imagining uh, our, having any of these things. Many good things are not, you know, they're not necessarily idols. But the question is how important are they to us? What then is an idol? Well, it's anything that's more important to us than God. Anything that absorbs our heart, our imagination more than God. Anything we seek to give us what only God can give us. So to dream is not idolatry. 
But we must guard against good things becoming idols in our lives. In the notes, I put a quotation by John Calvin, the the French uh, theologian who wrote his institutes by the age of 25, just awesome intellect. And uh, he, in one of his writings, says, the human heart is a factory of idols. We can produce idol after idol. We have this capacity. What's going on then in the world? If the world is uh, able to turn its attention and invest uh, so much in something that it becomes an ultimate thing for us, who will guide us? Who will give us the discernment we need to discern when something is becoming an idol for us? Well, as it happens, this week uh, we were invited out to lunch and we heard the story of the bank and the pesos. Now, I just need to tell you this story. These friends uh, were going to South America. They were going, actually going to four co- countries. And they went to their bank. And I'm not going to say which of the big four it was. All right? I don't want to dob anybody in. So they're going to the, their bank, and they want currency in four, for four countries. And one of those countries was Argentina. They were going to be in Argentina. And they knew they could use their cards, but they wanted some cash. So they decided to take $500 worth of cash in Argentine pesos. And, and so they did. They had uh, these big currency uh, pesos. And when they went to, to, uh, to uh, spend one, um, they were told that it was counterfeit. They'd been given counterfeit money. Well, so they... They presumably used one or two others, but they brought three back to the bank in Melbourne and took them to the bank, and the bank was massively embarrassed, you know, apologised profusely. We now have a machine that tells us, that picks up the falseness in this currency. Apparently, the Argentine peso has, has been steadily devalued since the 1990s. If you look it up on Wikipedia, you'll, you'll discover that they tried to freeze its value at one peso for one American dollar, but then it, it went down to three, and then it went down to ten, and then it went down to a hundred, and it's even more devalued now. So the, the, adult, the, uh, the, the currency, the bank, was obviously f- having trouble keeping up with the uh, counterfeit currencies that were out there. Now I say this came across to me as a kind of parable, because what about ourselves as the church? Surely we should be able to look to the church to be free of idols, to be able to say, look, no, uh, good things can become an idol. How do we work out whether it is or it isn't? So, well, what about if the problem's in the church as well? What about if we're not doing it? What about uh, the idols we discover in our churches? And I've picked up three from Tim Keller, who has a book, uh, and I put a, the name of the book and a quotation from it in the leaflet. The book is Counterfeit Gods. So I, I picked up three of his ideas which resonated with me. The first is um, it might be, our theology might become an idol. Right? It's a kind of a, a framework, if you like, uh, and, and you've got all your theological points nicely sorted out and you know where you get them from and and so you're very happy with your theology. And I, this one resonated with me because I think I've been there. I remember having a pretty superior attitude to some of the people who had read less theology than me when I was at university. Um, I remember looking back uh, at the Bible I used when I was an engineering student. And in, in the letter to the Ephesians of all things... I had marked many passages in the first three chapters, which were all the theology. But when you get to the end of chapter three, Paul starts to say, well, this is how it works out. And I'd marked one or two places, but I wasn't so interested in how it all worked out in my everyday life. Speak the truth in love, work hard, give generously, all sorts of things there that were kind of less important to me than getting the superstructure. So... So 
So we can do this. We, we may be, we need, I'm not saying that theology is bad. I'm just saying don't worship your theology. We worship a person who has loved us. And the second thing in churches is uh, status. I don't know how bishops feel about having a seat in the House of Lords, but it must be pretty, pretty amazing to be a bishop in the Church of England and know you can go and speak in the House of Lords. I don't know how many people listen to the bishops when they speak in the House of Lords, but then there's a hierarchical structure. But even among those of us who don't have hierarchical structures in our churches, and Presbyterian is about as flat as you can get, we have elders... It's a church governed by presbyters. That's the Greek word for elder. So here, here are the elders. And, but are some elders more important than others? Or do some get more power than others? So what about ministers? I remember when I went to Warburton many years ago and uh, I, was, I, I tried to arrange for a team of ladies, called them the care team, to visit between my visits because I couldn't visit everybody as often as I felt they needed but some people really wanted the minister to visit them. Yeah. No. So we've got to be careful about this, this idea of status. And, and so you, you read as somebody's the lead pastor in such a church or the senior minister and so on. Um, we need to be careful about that pursuit of uh, prestige or influence. And the third thing I think is important is that we, we may find ourselves in danger of thinking of uh, the way we live being good, you know, uh, being known for, I've called it in my notes, I've called it moral rectitude. We are upright people. We don't do certain things. Do not lie. Right? Do not steal. Do not defraud one another. There's all these injunctions are there in the New Testament and we don't do those things and, and we start almost almost without realising it to sort of think yeah, we're nice people and we're giving ourselves credits but we're only just being the kind of people we should be when we do those things. We don't get credit for being the kind of what a person should be. So how do we... Uh, I'm going to give you an example of this that, that uh, I remembered from a long time ago. But I was at a youth rally in Scotland in the days of my youth. Christine, I can't remember if you were there or whether you were in France at this time. But the speaker, I'm speaking to 150 young people, uh, decided to pick on the girls because there were a lot of them not wearing any covering on their heads. They weren't wearing hats. And he, he came down hard on them because they should have their heads covered. They should be wearing hats. And he said, you might say this is just one man saying this to you, but I'm telling you it's one man and God. Now, what a, what a sort of sense of moral rectitude he must have had. You know, I and God, God and I know that you should wear hats. So we've got to be careful that we make, uh, we let the things that are, uh, the Greek word is adiaphora, that is the things that are neither good nor bad. Uh, should I have a pool in my backyard or not? That's not it's neither, you, there isn't a right or wrong answer to it. There, there's a different answer and you have to work that through. And, and the way you dress, I think the Christian dress code is modesty, uh, functionality, ahead of flair and show and glitz. Uh, Christians are not meant to be the glitterati except that they're meant to in some way shine like the stars in the sky because of the quality of their lives. So we need to be careful that we're not taking credit for these things. And if we get them wrong, if we make these things idols in the church, and I think we do at times, we need to be careful that we don't criticize society for the things that we're doing wrong. We need to get it right in our own backyard. The true God, says Les Murray, the true God gives his flesh and blood. I think that's a, it's a great line. I brought the humans back into the picture because I think this is a good thing. Uh, what are we going to say about this? 
Well, we're made in God's image, Genesis 1. That's the Christian creation story and the Jewish creation story. I really feel sorry for Alexander in this Bible reading. You know, As soon as they saw that he was a Jew, they started to shout him down. So we're made in God's image. We're made for God. We might think that we should invest in money and wealth and that wealth will bring us happiness, but but wealth... Wealth is, money is a tool, it's an objective thing that, that won't f- satisfy our souls. Jesus said a story about a man who built big, I will build bigger barns. Oh, f- you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. You'll leave it all behind. The famous story about a funeral in the St. Andrew's <laughs> Cathedral in Sydney. The city person, celebrity of some note, had died. Somebody at the front turned to a man in the back row behind him and said in quite a loud voice, how much did he leave? And in a stage whisper, he got the reply, all of it. You can't take it with you. So will we build a bigger barn? Is that the answer? Of course not. No other person can be all we need. Sometimes we invest in relationship and there are love songs which say this and, and it's, it's true that we feel that way at times, how much we depend on one another. But there is only one person who is everything we need and that person is described in John's Gospel chapter 1, became flesh and dwelt among us, described in Hebrews chapter 1, he has the very image of God. I showed you an image of, uh, of uh, Artemis before. The word used in Hebrews chapter 1 for, for the, the Christ is the Greek word um, character. The character was uh, the inscription on the, on the die that was belted with a hammer to turn a blank piece of metal into a coin. And what Hebrews 1 is telling us, Jesus is the very stamp of God's image. And so when John comes to the end of his, of his epistle, of his gospel, moving from John 1 through to John 19, a gospel full of double meanings, we have Pilate bringing out the tortured Jesus and saying to the crowd, behold the man. And John hears those words. Behold the man. Ecce homo, probably spoken in Latin, we don't know. Ecce homo, the man. John hears it and he realizes that this is the man we need. This is the one truly human person. This is the one in whom the image of God is undefiled. And that's what we should be like. We should have that image ourselves. And we need it. Um, Paul talks about Christ being formed in you in Galatians. And uh, it's there in in all the epistles. Not only Paul, uh, Peter and John both talk about the idea of Christ being shaped in us and God's spirit shaping our lives. So the true God gives himself for you. Augustine discovered in the fourth century, uh, prayed for by his, by his loving mother, uh, eventually discovered what he wrote in his confessions, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they rest in you. May that be something we discover uh, if we haven't already discovered it. I think Keith discovered it 76 years ago. May it be part of all of our lives. Amen. I'd like to, to lead you in prayer now and I've scripted a few things and we'll have a short pause for prayer as well. Let me pray. Almighty God, We confess that we are guilty of idolatry. We have visited the shrines of the idols of this world and we have not followed in the steps of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, as fully as we should. We thank you for the unfathomable depths of his love and his commitment to rescue and redeem a lost and wayward world. Forgive our waywardness and sin. Help us by your spirit to listen to his words and to walk in his ways so that our lives might be a witness to our love for you and for our neighbor. Help us in our relationships with one another to avoid deceit and pretense 
and to enjoy goodwill and honest communication so that we serve the interests of your purposes among us. We lament that we live in a world where the worship of mammon creates bonded labor, the worship of fortuna creates gambling addiction, the worship of Aphrodite creates exploitation and ruin. Turn us from the idols of beauty, power, money and achievement. The ancient gods were bloodthirsty and hard to please, and they still are. We know the heartfelt joy when that which is lost is found. We are grateful that we live in a community where massive effort is expended to seek a missing child, and we rejoice that Cleo Smith was found safely. We're so grateful to be able to meet together again today around your word, to sing your praises and to meditate on your grace toward us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Thank you that your yoke is easy and your burden is light and you give rest to all who come to you. As we remember the impact of COVID in the community, we again pray for overworked healthcare professionals at this time of heightened demand on their services. Thank you for the health care infrastructure that we so heavily depend upon, the busy hospitals. Today we hear of the ambulances being overcommitted, the work of GP and specialist doctors, imaging and pathology services upon which we depend. We pray for school students with VCE exams at this time, rounding off two school years of COVID impacted education. Help them give their best and in retrospect, may they find there have been compensations in the challenges of these times. We remember the poor nations of the world where vaccination rates are lamentably low and services overwhelmed. May the proclamation of Jesus, that other king, bring down the gods of power and war that the nations might care for their people and wage war no more. We pray especially for Algeria where believers are harassed and imprisoned, and also for neighboring Niger and distant Afghanistan, where there have been targeted killings. May there yet be outcomes of the COP26, which will bring about real progress in handling the climate issues of our times. Help us in the wealthy nations to participate in caring for creation, to benefit the poor of the world and our children and their children. Help us to be generous with our time, our talents and energy right here in Whitehorse, so that in cooperation with other churches, we may reveal whose we are and whom we serve. In the silence of our hearts, we commit to you, our elderly, frail, troubled and sick friends this morning. As we name them before you, Lord, we ask that they might have a sense that they too are being cared for. Our prayers we bring to you in the name of Jesus, who encourages us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is 423, O Jesus, King Most Wonderful. I'd like you to especially notice the words of the last verse when we get there. This is attributed to Bernard of Clairvaux.